Hi, in this video I want to look at the different textures that we can find in igneous rocks that are the result of the cooling history of that igneous rock. So by looking at these textures it's possible to reconstruct how these rocks cooled and crystallized. We need to start with a little bit of language then. The way we describe the crystals in the igneous rock is different from the way we describe, say, grains in a sedimentary rock. We need some new terms. The first of these is this word euhedral. It comes from a Greek word, literally means well-sided. These are crystals that have a, a regular form, something that is a distinctive uh, shape. It's recognisable because we see flat, straight-edged crystals within a rock, particularly in a thin section. If we look at this, we see a, a, an olivine crystal here, the a dark crystal in the middle. You can see we've got this quite regular, uh, flat-sided, hexagonal shape um, for the olivine crystal. This would be described as being euhedral. They form when the crystal can grow without being constrained by other crystals around it. So they tend to be coarse. They tend to uh, be some perhaps of the early form minerals, perhaps, um, where they're growing uh, still in liquid magma. A subhedral crystal is one that's sort of partly formed. There's some shape to it, but it's not quite as perfect as the euhedral one. Now, this is going to be obviously a little bit subjective. But you can see with this olivine crystal, we have got some flat surfaces, but some that, that aren't quite there. This one would be described as subhedral. It's not a term perhaps that uh, we use perhaps very often, um, but perhaps it's important we know. Far more common is the term anhedral. Anhedral means uh, without sides. So in these we don't see any regular crystal shape. The um, crystals have grown here with lots of other crystals growing around them, so there isn't time or space for the crystals to grow into their, if you like, preferred form. This is where we tend to get just sort of a mass of relatively shapeless crystals. We see an olivine here um, where there's no regular flat sides. This would be described as an anhedral crystal. Okay. If we now look at the whole rock, there are some words that we need to get used to using. The first of these is equicrystalline. Now in an equicrystalline uh, texture, all the crystals in the rock are, are roughly the same sort of size. And we get this as a result of a steady rate of cooling. Now that could be a slow steady rate, it was a fine grain, uh, a coarse grain equicrystalline texture, or it could be a fast rate of cooling, which will give us a fine grain equicrystalline texture. In this rock we can see the crystals are all roughly the same sort of size. Now it's important with this texture to look at the, the bulk or the majority of the rock rather than trying to find one or two little crystals that may be slightly different from the others. We need to take the big picture when we're interpreting this. A porphyritic texture sees different sizes of crystals within a rock. We get some uh, very large crystals, we call these phenocrysts, that are surrounded by uh, finer grained um, crystals we call a ground mass. And we think this is produced by two stages of cooling. If we look at this rock, 
we can see we've got some extremely large uh, phenocrysts, in this case of orthoclase feldspar. You can see how they're quite euhedral, very straight sided. Okay. Uh, and that's surrounded by this uh, much finer grained ground mass of crystals, um, less than a millimeter in diameter. So clearly, here we've had. Um, a stage of cooling where these uh, crystals, the phenocrysts, are able to grow uh, unimpeded, uh, and then a period of time where perhaps we have much faster cooling, crystallizing the rest, the remainder of the liquid around those larger phenocrysts. So these phenocrysts are these uh, euhedral crystals. Now, one of the most famous examples of this is a granite from uh, a place in Cumbria in the north of England called Shap. And here we see some striking um, orthoclase phenocrysts that are centimeters across. The surrounding uh, minerals then are uh, a ground mass of quartz, and biotite, with maybe some plagioclase thrown in there as well. If we have a look at the rock, we can see this very, very distinctive texture. Okay, the large orthoclase uh, phenocrysts, again, you can see they're quite euhedral, and then this uh, anhedral ground mass uh, of quartz, so the gray stuff, little crystals of uh, biotite, uh, the darker stuff, and some plagioclase making the white colored minerals. We will be looking at this rock in class, maybe several times. There are some other textual features that we can find within igneous rocks. The first of these is what we call a vesicular texture. And this is where we find um, cavities within an igneous rock. And these are frozen gas bubbles. In this case, you can even see the gas bubbles that have been uh, stretched out by the flow of the lava. Now, vesicles are important, not only for showing us the flow, like in this particular example, but also they indicate that this rock has been crystallizing under very little pressure. It's a feature perhaps we're more likely to find in a lava flow than we will do in an intrusion. These bubbles will form like when you, for example, release the pressure in a, in a bottle of Coke. You get the bubbles forming. In this case, though, they were able to freeze in place when the rock crystallized. Sometimes these vesicles get filled in. Um, Water passing through the um, the rock later on, or left behind uh, when the rock um, crystallized, may have dissolved minerals in it. Um, these will actually fill up then with other minerals, perhaps minerals that weren't originally in the magma. These rocks, it's, you've got to be careful with not to interpret them as porphyritic. But if you look at the shape of the, the amygdales, these filled-in vesicles, you can see that they're, they're really quite different from the phenocrysts that we saw in the porphyritic texture. If we take it to its extreme, we can find vesicular rocks that are so vesicular, it means the resulting rock is very low density. I have even seen some of these um, rocks in Iceland that will float on water. This is what we call a pumice. And you can see the majority of this rock is actually void space. If you like, this is the froth on top of a lava flow, crystallized and frozen. So, to conclude, we can see that the cooling history of an igneous rock is reflected in its texture. That allows us as geologists 
to interpret that cooling history. It's a very important part of geology. But it does mean that we must master the language that we need to be able to communicate it. And also the ideas that underpin the concept of tex igneous textures. Don't forget to come up with your interesting question and bring it along to class. I'll see you then.